Hi, welcome to the professional development series on giving great technical oral communication. This is video number two of the series and we'll talk about preparing your presentation. So the first video was talking about how you plan your presentation. This one is going to be how you prepare it. Next one we're going to talk about actually how you stand up there and deliver. So the high level organization when you're preparing your presentation looks something like this. You have a title slide, then you'll have some overview and background of the topic. You'll get, then get into the supporting details, examples, and questions. You'll summarize things and then give an acknowledgments at the end. So the title slide should have a couple of things. It should have the title of your talk, hence the title slide, and it should have what the title of the talk actually is. It should have the authors and the co-authors. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people stand up there and not put their name on the title of the slide. The title slide, who are you, who else helped you write the thing, and what's the title of your talk. Where are you from? If you're presenting externally, it's important to list things like The Ohio State University as to where you're presenting from. Internally within the same school, perhaps you identify yourself for, with a particular class or a particular lab group or something like that. Sometimes it's good to put sponsors on your title slide as well, or sometimes they prefer to be on slide two. So something you typically sort out with your sponsor, but either way it should be up towards the front of the presentation. All right, after you get your title slide, Usually there's some sort of organizational overview of the talk. It tells the audience what they are going to hear. So what's the scope of your talk? Is it theoretical? Are you presenting results? Are you leading a discussion? Are you facilitating feedback? What's happening in the talk and what are the expectations? Do you expect them to just sit there and listen to you intently as to what you're going to say? Or are you going to ask them questions? Are you going to lead discussion? You can get that feedback from them. It gives you a chance to state your key point early in the talk, and it's one of the themes that are going to be in this lecture series about stating your key points multiple times throughout your presentation. Now, this does not have to be slide two. For example, if I'm giving a 45-minute talk at a seminar, I might give background information for about five, ten minutes, somewhere in that range, five to seven minutes of background information. After I get through the background and then say what the purpose of my talk is going to be, then I give this organizational slide to say, here's what the rest of I'm talk about for the rest of my time here. After I've warmed the audience up with some general background leading to what specifically I was going to research. So it doesn't have to be slide two. A lot of people think this outline slide, organizational slide, has to be the second slide of the talk because that's the rule or something like that. That you have to give it a slide two. It doesn't have to be slide two. It doesn't have to be there at all for all that matters. For example, if you're at a conference, everyone knows that if you have 12 minutes to talk, generally you're going to give some background, make a hypothesis, methods, results, conclusions, and wrap it up at the end. Everyone knows that what the format is going to be, so you don't need to outline what everyone knows is going to come. Besides, if you're only talking for 10 or 12 minutes, you don't have a spare 30 seconds to work with while wasting that time on an organizational slide where everyone knows what's going to happen anyway. So, for example, for a final defense, uh, undergrad oral defense, master's thesis, PhD thesis, you might introduce yourself, give the general background, what's your problem statement, what have you done, what you define, then why do we care? Then what's next after all that? So that might you do there for a oral defense might look something like this, whereas if you're giving a progress report, for example, in a senior capstone design project, you might have to redefine the project, what it is that you're doing, generally speaking, then what are the key issues? Identify what the key issues are, how you're working on them, what are potential solutions, what you think is the most important potential solution, prioritize the next steps, maybe solicit feedback from the audience, and always tie your priorities back to your action steps so that you're making sure whatever you're doing aligns with what the general goals are. Now, whatever you do, don't do this. Please don't do this. Don't say, okay, I'm going to start off some introduction, then I'm going to go with some background, then motivate what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to state my purpose. After my purpose, I'm going to go through some methods, results, discussion, shortcomings, and lastly, I'm going to wrap it up with some conclusions. Well, no kidding you're going to do this. This could be any organizational slide from any talk that I'm ever going to see. It's not particularly novel that you're going to give the background before the motivation and then results after the methods, and then you're going to give some discussion on the results and the methods. Anyone can do this. It's not all that instructive to give this rather generic reference slide. Do this instead. For example, you might want to give some background on spinal cord injury. Then after you give that background on spinal cord injury, how individuals with a spinal cord injury sometimes use a wheelchair and they might need a tray to go on that wheelchair. So then the purpose of this project was to design such a tray for wheelchair users. They're going to talk about the design process, demo the thing, 
give some discussions and next steps. See how this slide is much more specific to your particular product rather than the generic one I showed before. So as you're going through this talk, again, like I mentioned a couple slides ago, always start with the big picture. What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the purpose of your talk, etc.? If your audience doesn't immediately understand what you're trying to do, they're lost. And if they're lost, they might never come back. And if they never come back because they have smartphones, they have their iPhones, they have the new Samsung phones, they can play, they play Candy Crush, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever it might be, other than listening to you and giving them their talk. So you should always explain the approach, how you took it, and how it relates to the big picture then refer back to the big picture at the end. Something I did at a conference many years ago was that in the beginning of my talk, I said, okay, here's what my purpose was, and we asked ourselves these three questions. So I put out those questions at the beginning of the talk, went through my methods, my results, and at the end, I brought those questions back up and I answered them. And a rather well-respected woman in the field came up to me and said, hey, Rob, I really like what you did. I said, well, thank you. She said, do you know what you did? I said, I no, not really. What is, it, what is it that I did that you particularly liked? She says, you asked a question and then you answered it. I said, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? Ask questions and answer them. She's like, yes, no one does that. So then I started to watch presentations with that in mind and how many times people set out a hypothesis or a purpose and then never refer to it at the end. They only assume that the audience remembers what their hypothesis or purpose was rather than explicitly st restating again at the end, here's what I hypothesize and look, I accept it or I reject it. You can make it that much more clear without a lot of work to refer to it at the beginning, the middle, the end. It makes it that much more clear for your audience. So you should repeat your key points as an old mantra. You should tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them what you just told them. A way to do this, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told them, is to state your key points at the beginning, in the middle, and the end using short internal summaries. And it could be reusing that organizational slide. Here's the organizational slide. I'm going to talk about these three topics. I talk about the first one, and maybe you gray that one out, and then you talk about the next two points, or you highlight what's coming up. It reminds the audience of where you've been and where you're, where you're, where you're going with your talk. Okay, so that's how you organize. Let's talk about getting to the individual slides. You should use a simple slide template. So I'm using here a modified version of the acceptable thing at the Ohio State University. I have our school logo, scarlet, gray, and white, a little bit of red, I'm sorry, a little bit of scarlet, excuse me, for emphasis. Rather simple template. It should not be distracting from the talk, and it shouldn't take up the majority of the slide. I've seen slide templates that come in from the top to the bottom, quarter away from the top, quarter up the bottom, and come in from the sides as well. So all that's left is this little window in the middle where people are trying to jam all their text and they have this really elaborate thing on the outside that might look really cool, but takes up all their real estate so that you can't use the majority of the slide. It's all dedicated to whatever the slide template is. You also have meaningful title slides. If you have one slide of introduction and one slide of results, that's great. However, multiple slides that say, introduction, 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 doesn't really convey to the listener what's actually on your slide. So multiple slides that have the same title really have no insight and make it actually harder for the listener to understand what you're going to say. You should use sans serif fonts. It's been shown that sans serif fonts like Arial and Helvetica and Geneva are easier to read than serif fonts like Times, which is much harder to read. You should capitalize the first bullet point uh, in on your line. You should have, actually you should avoid using sentences at all at all costs. Try to keep them sh sh a little bit shorter. If you use all caps, it looks like you're shouting at the audience. So don't use all caps to shout. You should use a bold indication, like I have here on the slide here, for highlighting. You should avoid the death by PowerPoint. PowerPoint's great. However, there are all these clip art images. Don't have a clip art image on every slide just because you feel like you need to take up space. When at all possible, use scanned images or digital pictures that preferably you took yourself. Don't use more than a couple of these clip art images, maybe for emphasis every once in a while, but really don't overdo it because it will distract from the audience. Don't use too many animations. I've seen a couple of students and even a well-respected faculty member where every slide transition was animated and every slide transition being animated with a different slide transition. There is the scroll up, there's a scroll down, 
There's a swipe this way, the swipe that way, swipe up, swipe down, the spiral in or whatever it might be, all of which got to be a joke after a while where the audience was trying to guess what the next animation was on the animation pane because obviously this person was just moving right along the animation pane trying to find a new animation for every slide. And the presenters all thought it was cute, but in reality it wasted time because it takes maybe a second or two for the longer animation things to animate their way in. That over 20, 30 slides, you're adding a couple minutes to your presentation. It also shows you have way too much time on your hands. If you have enough time to animate every individual slide, you could be using that elsewhere. These animations are effective when used sparingly, so not on every slide or maybe to only highlight certain points. After a while, you become sort of numb to it and then it actually becomes more of a distraction than, you can, than it is a, as a tool to emphasize things. In general, engineers are simple people, so too much glitz and glam actually distracts from your content and it weakens your presentation. We keep the glitz and the glam in terms of the animations, sound effects, and like that, used sparingly. They provide emphasis without being too much of a distraction. Videos are great. They can present things in ways that pictures cannot. They can often be imported right into PowerPoint. Some of the even PowerPoint add-ins or PowerPoint plugins allow you to pull YouTube videos and put them right onto your slide. But whenever you're showing a video, you have to make sure it works. You have to make sure it works. You have to make sure it works. Do you need to play it in a separate window? If you have to jump to a web page, for example, do you have it keyed up immediately at the right point in, in the web page? You don't have to sort of scroll through video while you're trying to give your talk. Do you know how to quickly switch windows on whatever operating system that you're using on, on your computer? If you need to switch windows, can you switch windows quickly? Does the computer have the right video player? Typically, this is with a Apple product. If you need QuickTime or you don't have QuickTime, do you have do you have the right software you need on your computer? Do you need how to adjust the video settings so you don't just get a big old black box on your screen? Do you need to check the sound quality and equipment? So if you need to broadcast to a large audience, you have more than just the speakers on your own laptop computer. Do you know how to plug into overhead speakers or the sound equipment in the room? Do all those work? Do you have all the right cables? All these sorts of things. Now, one time I gave a presentation that I adjusted all my video settings and my sound equipment before I gave my talk, but there were a bunch of us faculty going in a row. The gentleman who went before me didn't do that. He was up there monkeying around with all the, all the settings while he was giving his talk, couldn't figure it out, and then just gave up, edited his talk, and I had 20 seconds to go and load my talk and go. So I couldn't use my video and my sound because the guy before me just ruined the whole thing. But So I had to adapt on the fly and actually narrate the video. So assuming you don't have someone going before you sabotaging the equipment and sabotaging your ability to give the presentation, check all this well, well in advance before when you're actually going to give the talk. Getting to plots and figures, keep them simple, readable, and easy to understand. Take the time to really make a nice figure, and I'll show this in the next couple slides here. Software like Adobe Illustrator is actually easy to use once you, once you get maybe a, maybe a day or so of a learning curve or half a day with a learning curve, it will clearly differentiate your work and try not to overly cover, clutter your slide. So for example, this is right out of, of Excel. It's thin lines on a gray background with some other lines. Your y-axis doesn't even have an axis, has very small numbers. X-axis has one, two, three, four, five, six, which doesn't really tell anything to the reader. It seems like a rough job. And maybe if you're giving a progress report where this slide is never going to be used again, it's okay to put things, quote unquote, hot off the presses right into your presentation. The reality, I can take that same data, make it nicer in Illustrator with, maybe this took me 20 minutes or less. Now I have a nice y-axis that's curry labeled, illustrative x-axis with informative names on the x-axis, large text, bolded font, nice thick lines at clear colors. This is looks more, much more appealing than the one on the previous slide. I can't tell you how many days in graduate school that I just spent time making figures and making nice slides. I kept having to remind myself I was getting a graduate degree in mechanical engineering, not some sort of art degree because I was using Adobe Illustrator so much. But it really does differentiate things. I also try not to use this popular format where people try to put all their text on one side of the screen and all their pictures on the other side of the screen. What happens is a couple of things. You're squeezing all your text, so now your text looks compressed. 
and then you're splitting the audience's focus. Some people might be reading the text while you're explaining the figure. Other people might be looking at the figure while you're explaining the text. You should ask yourself, do you really need the figure or do you really need the text? If you don't need the figure, get rid of it. Just put the text on the screen. If the text isn't really all that meaningful to you, take your figure and stretch the figure out over the entire screen. Most presentation software like PowerPoint or even Keynote have a presenter's view. So if you're using the presenter's view, you can leave notes to yourself that only you can see in the presenter's view and the audience isn't seeing the presenter's view, they're only seeing, seeing what the slides are. That way you don't have to put the notes on the slide, you can leave the slide for only the important information such as what the figure is going to be. Also, don't impress me with putting all your plots all in the same figure, uh, all in the same slide, and all your figures all on the same slide, all in the same time. The record I saw was 16. So it was four across and four down. So 16 plots all at the same time. And there was a bit of a fancy template as well, so he came in a little bit from the top, a little bit, a little bit, from, a little bit from the side. And the presenter, I still remember this, Clara said, as you can clearly see in the upper left corner, no, I can't clearly see in the upper left corner. You're using a, less than the 16th of the real estate on the screen, and I can't clearly see all those small lines on that screen. Now, if you're comparing two figures against each other, one against each other, for example, maybe on this slide, maybe I'm doing the two here in the middle. I'm comparing them run against each other, or top to bottom. Then it is illustrative to have two things right next to each other, but only if you're making the comparison between them, not here's all my data, and you should be impressed because I have all this data, and I'm going to dazzle you with all this data here in front of you. So use this over multiple slides. Don't blast me with all your plots and all your figures all at the same time. Also try not to do this. This is, looks like a very complicated slide where I have multiple lines going in multiple different directions with some illustrations on the slide. If I'm looking at this, my first indication is, wow, there's a lot going on there. So instead of blasting again, the listener with this complicated slide dole it out over a couple slides. So this is a plot of normal varus valgus knee rotations as a function knee flexion angle on the x-axis. So this is what happens in normal healthy knees. People who have varus osteoarthritis, so a little bit bow-legged. If you're a little bit knock-kneed, you're in valgus, looks like that. And then if you're neither bow-legged or knock-kneed, you're sort of coming there in the middle. Again, this process of walking the audience through the, all the lines instead of putting them all there up at the same time. You need to cite things. You must cite all non-original material, statistics, numbers, things like that nature. Images, if you scan it, cite it fully. If you modify it or adapt the figure in some way, just say after or adopted from or some way that you are noting, noting both the original source and that you've made some changes to it. If you don't do these things, it looks like plagiarism. Also looks like you're making things up. So it actually is dishonest and is dishonest and hurts your credibility as a speaker in multiple ways. Because in bigger audiences, the author might actually be there, or one of the author's colleagues, or one of her students. And it looks pretty bad when you're citing some information that you using some information that you don't cite. The author stands up and asks your questions, and this just bad things are going to happen. So, for example, if I'm talking about surgical technique and a total knee replacement, talk about the challenges with the existing instrumentation, and then maybe how small alignment errors lead to complications. What well, you should be noticing here that I, up here I have a one, up here I have a two, up here I have a three, and I have that information. Whoop, and I have that information down here at the at the bottom of of my slide. Now I always put this citations on the actual slide, and you can see on this slide I have the author's last name, first author's last name at all, an abbreviation for the journal, volume, page numbers, and year. This basically gives me enough information where some of the audience can go look up this journal article or this book or this website or whatever it might, might be if they wanted to find it, and it's immediately on the slide. See, a lot of presentations where they save sort of a reference slide to the end of the, of, of the presentation. Well, don't save it for the end. There's no reason to save it for the end because typically you blow through that in maybe two seconds at the end. And what happens is, okay, say I'm using this slide, and I want to know how alignment errors of less than three degrees occur even with the best equipment. So I'm remember, remembering reference one. And let's say it's not on the, my slide. So the rest of the talk, I'm just thinking one, 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 one. Remember one, remember one, 
remember one. Then I'm not really paying as much attention to the rest of the slides as I should be because I'm trying to remember reference one. Maybe if I have my smartphone, I take out a note or I write down with a, a pen and pen, pencil until you get to that wonderful reference slide at the end and you go through it in two seconds and I forget what reference one is or I can't pick up a, what reference one is in enough time. And then I'm sort of unsatisfied with your talk because it's one really key point I wanted to look up later I didn't have a chance to get to. Whether if, rather if it's actually on the slide, I can find it immediately, write it down, make the note, then pay attention to you fully at the end. So use the citations and have them on the actual slide, not at the end. Handouts and demos are great. Uh, paper handouts have pros and cons. You should ask whether or not they are necessary, whether everyone has a chance to uh, have one. If you're passing them, passing them around, will they distract from your talk or add to it? So you have to weigh these pros and cons on your own. Demos are fully great if they work. Second most important thing to realize is you should make sure that they work and make sure that you have enough time. So I was giving a fairly important presentation during my grad career where I built this device and my advisor said, hey, it's really done a good job with this. You should demo this during this oral exam I had for my PhD. I said, well, that's great. What if it doesn't work? He said, then you look stupid. Good. But if it works, you'll look really smart. So do I do it or do I not do it? He's like, you should do it. So I practiced that sucker. And sure enough, it worked. It worked really well. And it was, and the audience was pretty impressed and worked to my benefit. I've seen too many other, say, capstone design teams say, we built this cool device and we're going to demo it for you. Instead of in there monkeying around with it, they can't get it to fold or unfold or operate or whatever it's going to be. And they're, as they're fighting with this thing, one, it makes you wonder if they actually know how the thing works. And if it's a time presentation, all that time they spent monkeying around with the device takes away from times they need to spend in other aspects of the presentation. So make sure it works and make sure you have enough time to show the demo that you actually want to do. If you're passing around objects, making sure they are clean and safe, not covered in grease, sharp edges, anything like that. Make sure they are up to date. As Make sure you have enough from the audience. If Again, if you're in a room of 10 people, Everyone should be able to have a chance to get that. If you're in a room of 200 people, the people in the way back in the audience are going to feel a little bit upset that they didn't have a chance to play with the cool toy you hand to people in the first 50 rows. You should always have an acknowledgement slide. These are people who helped you, advisors, professors, machinists, electricians, staff members, fellow students, lab mates, anyone who did something that helped you throughout, your, throughout the preparation of your, of your presentation and through the work that you're presenting. Companies that did cool stuff for you, places that gave you money, whether these are research sponsors for the whole project, scholarships or fellowships you get individually, all those sorts of things. You should always have an acknowledgement slide. Always good to show gratitude and always good to acknowledge that you did not do this all on your own. So when you're preparing your talk, you should tell a good story. Use a simple template with easy to read text and clear transitions that talk about your point at the beginning, middle, end of your talk so that you're using these key internal summaries to help people follow along with what you're trying to do. Use professional looking figures, typically one per slide, and really take the time to make them look nice. If you make them look nice, it will leave a great positive lasting impression on your audience. If you have handouts, handouts and demonstrations, make sure that they work, make sure you have enough time to use them. Thanks for watching part two, on to part three.